There are vampires in Starfinder. I've done a whole video on that already. However, today we're going to be talking about one specific kind of vampire, the Moroi. We're going to talk about their abilities. We're going to talk about their weaknesses. We're going to go a little bit more in depth as to what they are and how you might integrate them into your game. Now, if you want to know where I found this information, that would be Adventure Path number 42 on page 56, Whispers of the Eclipse. If you're interested in getting a copy for yourself, check the description down below. When we talk about vampires as we traditionally know them, the Moroi are the run-of-the-mill vampire. They are what you would expect. They are undead creatures. They can only go out at night. Now, if you're doing interstellar travel, they can only go out when there is no UV light, nothing coming in from a star. You have to have special ship lights, otherwise they will die. Just because someone is playing a vampire or they exist doesn't inherently mean that they are evil. Just because you're undead doesn't immediately mean that you serve the Great Devourer. Anyone from Eox will confirm that. Vampires can integrate into society quite well. They can take the night shift if you're dealing on something planet side. If it's a planet with a dark spot in it, that is constantly besieged by night, you might find some vampires here. You likely will find vampires setting up colonies in asteroids. So working this into your game as a GM should be rather easy. If you're a player and your GM has allowed you to be a vampire, how do they integrate into society? How do they integrate into the crew? Do the crew willingly supply themselves as blood bags so nobody else has to put up with that? Or do you hide it and try to make the best of it? Anyone who worships a righteous god may have a problem with your existence. And not to mention anyone who worships Phrasma. They tend to not like the undead. If I was going to let a player be a vampire in my game, I would allow them the abilities and the bonuses that come with being a vampire, and we'll talk about those in just a second. I would also make sure that depending on the type of vampire that has turned them, they would get the same weaknesses that apply to that vampire type, and I will also cover those after the abilities. If you're going to use them as a monster, the base stats are as follows, but feel free to tweak these to fit the scenario that you're playing. Maybe they're not this high of a level. Maybe you want something that is a little bit stronger. I believe it's the Alien Archives 1 that has creature generation rules, so use those to adapt the creature to your situation. At 125 hit points, 20 EAC and 22 KAC, this will make the Moroi a CR8 creature. They have plus three to the initiative, which is not bad, but they do also have blind sense vibration for 30 feet, and they have dark vision up to 60 feet. Vampires are also very perceptive, so this one will also have a plus 16 when it comes to its perception. Now, vampires can regenerate quite quickly, but they have to do this in the security of their coffin. So as a vampire, if you are sleeping in your coffin, you regenerate five hit points every round. This would be known as Fast Healing 5. And then they get the Undead Immunities, and then they have resistance to cold and electricity of up to 10. Now that's for the monster block. If I was doing this for a player, I would just make it equal to their character level. As a monster, this thing can move up to 30 feet, but it does have Spider Climb, which allows it to move up the walls at the same speed that it can move. And these creatures are mostly for close combat. They want the neck biting for feeding, they have the long claws for attacking, and the attack will be at plus 25 with a base 14 damage plus 3d4 damage. For CR8, this is a pretty decent monster. Now for offensive abilities, they have Blood Drain, which I will talk about in a second. They have Communalism, and they have Dominate. There's also a few other cool things you can do as a Moroi, and I will talk about all of those abilities in just a second. Vampires are also partially telepathic. They can communicate this way for up to 30 feet. There is also a vampire language called Children of the Night. I would argue being turned into a vampire doesn't immediately grant you access to this language, but if you are a vampire, you would start being able to hear it. Or maybe you could start learning it from the vampire who turned you. If you're starting off as a vampire and your GM allows it, then discuss the language with them. Vampires also gain some spell-like abilities. Once per day, they can cast Deep Slumber and Fear. Three times a day, they can cast Command Undead. Hold Person, Inflict Pain, as well as See Invisibility. And at will, they can cast Memory Lapse and Necromantic Revitalization at first level. This is a healing spell for vampires, but undead specifically. To cast it on a living person, it does damage to them instead. But for the undead, it's a good thing. When a vampire is reduced to zero hit points, they don't 
actually die, they're already dead. But they can't start gaining any health back until they are placed into their coffin. Now let's talk about the abilities of the vampire and how they work. Blood Drain would be the obvious one to start with. For a vampire that sucks the blood of a living creature, they are supposed to gain one negative level, and the vampire also gains five temporary hit points for doing this. The target must be grappled for this to work, and the target also has to fail a DC 16 Fortitude saving throw. If this creature is, for whatever reason, willing, then I would just skip the saving throw altogether. If this was a situation where a player's crew were actively supplying themselves as blood bags, what I would do instead of the negative level is I would change the hit points by five. So the character who has had their blood drained loses five temporarily for the hour it takes, and the vampire would gain five for the hour. The Moroi, they also have the ability to change shape. They can take on the appearance of a small or medium-sized animal. They have to have seen it before. If they were planet-side, it would likely be a native species or a native creature to that planet. While they are in this animal shape, they also gain the senses and abilities of that animal. Not only can the Moroi change shape into an animal, they also have a mist form. This is particularly interesting in the sense that at will, they can turn into vapor. They can go through any space that is not considered airtight. It's very, very difficult to damage a Moroi in this state, but while they are in this state, their regenerative abilities, they just don't work. Children of the Night is an ability for the vampire that allows them to communicate to nighttime creatures. I know I said that it was a vampire language, and it kind of is, but it's for controlling creepy crawlies. Any nocturnal animal or nocturnal creature, nocturnal swarm, bugs, whatever. The vampire is able to telepathically communicate to these creatures, to this swarm, whatever it may be, with simple instructions. However, the swarm is not able to communicate back. Now, if a Moroi is feeling particularly lonely or they want some more soldiers or just something to control, they can create their own spawn. If a Moroi drains its victim of blood and then gives its own, and buries that creature or victim in the ground for three days, it will arise as a new vampire. It will be less powerful than the one that has turned it, but it will be bound to the Moroi that created it. Now, if a vampire creates too many spawn, they can start to break free and develop free will of their own. Now, a vampire can also dominate a person. They can crush their will to resist. It is a will save of DC 16. If you're doing this as a player, GMs adjust your DCs accordingly to what you think should be fair. Keep in mind at DC 16, this is a CR 8 creature. Now, vampires also have some pretty big weaknesses. They can't enter a residence or an area without being invited. They cannot enter places that smell of garlic. So if you have a Yasoki cook who likes to use a lot of garlic, they're probably not going to get along too well. They have to be five feet away unless they pass a will save. This would be a DC 22 will save. Now that 22 is set for a CR 8. I would adjust this just a little bit either way, depending on the level of the vampire. You don't want to go too much, but you don't want to go too little. It's still quite a potent revulsion. Now the other big one is being exposed to direct sunlight to UV light. If you are standing in UV light for two rounds, a round is six seconds. If you are exposed to sunlight or UV light for 12 seconds, you will die. I would probably extend that if we're just talking about ship lighting, UV lighting, but if it's light from a star, you got 12 seconds to live. And that is dead dead. That is not, I'm reduced to zero hit points, get back in my coffin, I'll be fine later. You are done. They can't cross running water, which is really only a problem if you're planet side. Maybe if you are a GM who is allowing your player to be a vampire, maybe they can't cross certain sections of the ship because of the coolant systems. Get creative with this. And of course, they cannot enter the drift without being in their protective coffin. I would say this would apply on the return trip for the vampire as well. If you're in the drift and just running about, that should be fine. But if you want to cross back into the material plane, then you need to seek the protection of your coffin. And your coffin doesn't have to just be a wooden box. It could be a cryo chamber. It could be a stasis pod. It could be a singular contained unit that the vampire sleeps in. In some cases on smaller ships, you'll find that this cryopod or this singular pod is hooked up to the cockpit 
so the vampire can control the ship even while being in the safety of their coffin. Vampires still suffer from the hunger. They need to feed, they must sustain themselves on the blood of living beings. Now how this gets accomplished in space can be a bit of a trick. If you're running as a monster campaign and you're fighting a bunch of vampires in space, maybe they have access to blood reservoirs. Maybe they have a crew of living beings that they have sustained themselves with. The other big weakness comes from stakes to the heart. If you get a wooden stake in the heart as a vampire, you don't die, but you drop unconscious. You, you can't move. There's nothing you can do to fight this. As long as that stake is in your heart, you can't regenerate. Even if you are put back in your coffin, you will stay at zero hit points and unconscious. Now the wording of this last part of the weakness gets a little bit interesting, so GMs tell me about your interpretation in the comments below. If a vampire with a stake in the heart has its head severed and removed, it's still not dead. Unless that head is thusly anointed by holy water, then that vampire will be destroyed. To me, that means even if a vampire is dismembered, it's not dead. If you put it back in the coffin, it will regenerate itself and return back to normal. But like I said, let me know in the comments below how you would handle this. Now this is just one video on several of the vampire types that can be found within Starfinder. If you'd like to get an overview of the others, please click on the video on your screen now. Thank you to all of my patrons who continue to support me and the channel. All of the super chats that come in, they are greatly appreciated. My name's Nathaniel. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.